Hello and uh, welcome back um, to the Q&A for Anne at 13,000 feet. I'm so glad to be here um, in conversation with Kasik Rudwanski and Dara Campbell. Um, yeah, in, in watching this film, you two, I'm always struck by the end of it where Anne just disappears off into the ether because throughout the film, we see this character who's in so much pain and she's struggling so much to connect with other people in, in such an intense and earnest way. And when she jumps out of that airplane, you kind of feel this moment of relief, but you're also kind of like worried, like, is she gonna land okay? Like she's, she's a little high. So you kind of like leave off the film with this like moment where you just like feel so alleviated and but also like concerned a little bit um and it's such a, a unique emotional feeling and I don't know in constructing this film over two years it's crazy dedication I was wondering what it was like for the two of you living with this character do you like is Anne someone you'd be friends with could you see yourself connecting with someone like her uh, in interesting question. Yeah, would you be friends with Anne there? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, um, I don't know if I'd be uh, friends with Anne in particular, but I can certainly like, um, hopefully she sort of teaches to uh, have compassion with people's behaviors or to hope what I would hope is to look into like what their behavior is at actually asking for like what it what she's doing is pushing people away but what she's obviously wanting is for people to be close to her so mm -hmm. like what would hopefully be someone's approach to someone behaving that way would be to make them feel comfortable make them feel safe make them mm -hmm. feel they're not going to be abandoned um and then maybe uh, they'll stop feeling that they need to try quite as hard, you know? Mm -hmm. That's how I, that's how I would try and be Anne's friend if I happened to be her friend. Yeah, no, it's interesting because you see all these amazing scenes where um, she's acting out and she's having a really hard time communicating and um, Kaz, in the edit, you decided to start the film off with all of these amazing moments where you see her work, she's in a relationship, she's out in the world. Um, and I love this like date scene where she shows up to have this like Tinder date with this guy and it's like not the guy who's like in the photos and she's like a little alarmed, but she decides to stay and you learn a lot about, I guess, like this character's mm -hmm. social generosity in this moment while she's like also in these scenes where she's being really difficult with other people and just having a really hard time communicating. And I felt like there was this amazing, I guess like simultaneous unraveling of this character. You're both kind of learning about her and these amazing character traits, but you're also moving the story along like in a really rigorous way. So I was curious to know how you went about building that. Yeah, it's um, interesting that you talk about the opening and the ending because those are both two things that I think we found as we made the film. Um, mm -hmm. The ending in particular definitely wasn't in the script and I didn't know it was possible until we started shooting some of the uh, skydiving sequences. And once we had that um, that footage and I uh, thought about it for a while, it, be it, it became the ending. But I think that captures something about the process with Anne in general is that we were constantly sort of debating the character or constantly thinking about interactions or learning from the character um, that if through, a, you know, these sort of, like you described the, um, the Tinder date scene or all these different sort of interactions that sort of uh, accumulate and sort of create a sort of mm -hmm. a portrait or a, a sort of a fractured portrait of a person. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that's, you know, where I was always sort of pointing the camera at these sort of uh, exchanges or these interactions that, uh, you know, that Anne is navigating and, mm -hmm. but also the people in the scene are also um, navigating and, um, you know, 
I think is fair to describe and sometimes as being difficult, but then I think also the people around her equally have, you know, their flaws or their, their sort of white lies or their, their sort of misrepresentations on the Tinder profile, for, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, 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 I think that's what I kept coming back to with these sort of juxtapositions or these, these uh, moments of, of uh, conflict or uh, exchanges between people and, and, uh, the, uh, yeah, being just sort of fascinated by people rubbing up against each other or the, the conflicts um, that come out of that. Mm, yeah, I remember that, that Tinder scene. I mean, it's funny because like probably even a bit too much so, but my instinct is to try and like make people around me feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think in that scene, that actor very much like, thought that like making the scene good would be to make the date good <laughs> like, <laughs> was like, he like treating it like was it, it was a date in a way I think he just like, like a I think on screen he, movie date I think he just like wanted me to be better at it or something which was like not Anne <laughs> like he wanted um he wanted us to form more of a rapport and you can kind of see um, see him kind of being like a bit disturbed by my behavior which is so funny because he doesn't seem to be concerned about his own behavior at all whatsoever <laughs> yeah he just uh, sorry go ahead he sells insurances is my favorite line in the film <laughs> yeah no it's it's a scene that uh that I find to be pretty hysterical um every time I I see it and I don't know and like speaking about I guess like Anne's needs and her like difficulty in conversation like I love the line where you're with your family and you say like do I need to teach everyone how to have a conversation and you can see that this character is just like so frustrated that they don't get the joke that's put on by the the joke master, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you know? And I think that like, in a way, the way that you approach characters and um, acting in films, I think a great visual metaphor that Kaz set up for you um, was that like, I don't know, I feel like in a way, in the way that you approach these roles, it's like you jump out of an airplane every time I, I see you like surrender to these characters and you just like kind of, you put all of yourself into it in, in a way that's really, really impressive. And I was wondering like for this role in particular, if there are certain kinds of like people or personalities um, or film characters that you like studied to, to build such a, a well-rounded person? Um, I mean, I think in, in there's two separate things. There's sort of like um, the performance and then like the character that was created, I think in the edit by Isla and Kaz, like in terms of performance and like being Anne in those scenes, it was this sort of like key motivating thing of, of her wanting to be close to people. And I, I've never heard someone say socially generous about her, but that's true. She does, mm -hmm. she does want to be around people and she does want mm -hmm. to give a lot to the situation. And she does kind of want to keep um, things going. But when, when people won't kind of go along with it or she starts feeling that she's been misunderstood um, then, then she starts to get like a little bit desperate or something mm -hmm. and starts mm -hmm. trying a little bit too hard. And so kind of going back to what Kaz was saying before of like finding uh, the character as we went, I feel like mm -hmm. on my part that required me not being way too precious about who I thought Anne was and kind of just being in each of those scenarios. And then, yeah, Kaz and I kind of finding out information about her through her reactions. And then yeah. I feel like, um, yeah, and then exactly you see this kind of fractured 
portrait of a person. And I, I think, I think there's something nice about um, the kind of strange incompleteness about her or something. Like she's not, um, she's never able to fully articulate herself or tell people who she is or what mm -hmm. she wants, you know? So why should the movie articulate that? Um, but it was nice when I, when I finally saw the movie um, to kind of get an idea of, of who she was in a way that I maybe hadn't had while actually shooting. Yeah, I feel like it's very much a fractured portrait about a fractured person. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, it, it's, you know, I, I love how um, empathetic and compassionate um, the gaze is on this character because it would be really easy I think to to villainize um an individual through all the the different situations that um you put her through Kaz and one thing that I really really loved um in doing a little bit of research about this film is that your mom uh, worked in this daycare she's been running it for 40 years um and you you talk a lot about like loving to shoot in like spaces that you know spaces that are familiar to you and that you grew up in this daycare and a lot of the people uh, that you know still work there. And I, I was wondering um, what your mom thought of the film when she saw it, what the people at the daycare thought, um, but how you kind of like went about using that location and building all of these different scenarios. Yeah, uh, my mom just retired um, last uh, year. Or congratulations, <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> right around the same time we wrapped production. And of course my mom's yeah. in the film. Uh, she plays the supervisor in the film. And yeah, it's an important place for a number of reasons. Um, yeah, I, 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 of course, went there as a child. And there was an incredible moment um, when I went back as an adult. And a lot of the teachers who looked after me uh, still work there. So there was this sort of interesting feeling of my memories of being there as a child and then, and then seeing these people as adults. And I really liked that. That really got like my brain stirring. So even just thinking about inspirations for this film, um, mm -hmm. some of the inspirations are from present day, but some of them are from memories of, of being a child and almost trying to understand what was going on with certain teachers. Um, the monologue, or maybe it's not a monologue, but the, uh, the story about the mercury and the broken thermometer is based off of something, a story my, my grade three teacher uh, told me. Um, but also I just love the daycare as, as a space, as just as mm -hmm. a microcosm of Toronto. It's one of the largest daycares mm -hmm. in the city. Um, 200 children go there. And it just seemed, um, you know, the tensions that are there. I mean, in general, just for the staff that work there, it's a high, high stress mm -hmm. job. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, what was great too, is that many of the teachers who currently work there made sort of little cameos in the film that we tried to sh use it as much as a sort of a real space. And also working with child actors, it was incredible. Half the scenes mm -hmm. were sort of done somewhat documentary-like. Uh, you know, the butterfly scene in the opening where we just sort of, Dara volunteered yeah. at daycare and we just sort of um, had her sort of, you know, you know, things would just happen. And then it was also great using it as a space to work with the little mini troupe of sort of child actors and take inspiration from them. Uh, Oliver in particular, mm -hmm. the shark boy, all of uh, the shark. Dial, yeah, he's amazing. Uh, is from is from Oliver. Uh, so yeah, it was definitely a, a huge part of the film, just just that constant inspiration. But yeah, also just like like you said, uh, personal inspiration too. Just knowing the building, um, blessing and a curse. Sometimes, I mean, it's some there are certain things I wanted to get from it. You know, I would almost push more. If, if I uh, perhaps I'd be a, I'd ra be a bit more rational if I didn't have wasn't so sentimental about the place but yeah there are certain sort of angles or just capturing certain aspects of it um you know I feel it like it has sorry I interrupted you Finish what go ahead Dara what were you gonna say <laughs> I'm just saying I think I think you have like a good kind of irreverence though for like uh mixing fact and fiction like like just in the way that that in representing the life of the daycare, that wasn't a matter of just going in and recording the daycare exactly as it was. Like you had to use a combination of the people that actually worked there, some like supplementary yeah. actors, the kids, and then also the set of child actors we'd work with or, or things like, 
I mean, I you probably don't care if I share this, but like like the how we wanted <laughs> go Anne, on. You wanted Anne <laughs> up on a a roof, and like that's a roof of a different building, you know. So it's not it's not just about having to represent something like truthfully exactly as it was, so much as combining these things to give an impression of what the place really feels like, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, there was another church that we used uh, for some mm -hmm. alternate angles or pickups. Yeah, that. Um, yeah, and it's really a mixture. You know, it's a mixture of wanting to display the daycare, um, wanting to display, you know, what this, what the, what the audience will see on screen. And then there's the the other aspect of it, what it represents to me, which I gravitate to just because it provides so much inspiration. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, there's no one way about it. And I think that sort of articulates, you know, how we work with a script and then how we work with improvisation that we, we sort of attack from many ways. <laughs> but really the key to the process is just a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of conversation. <laughs> uh, but we, yeah, we use a lot of methods to, to get what, you, what, what ultimately is on screen. Yeah. Well, it's funny because people always think of, of like Cassavetes as improvisation but the actual Cassavetes thing was that dual approach of having a script and then also having improvisation and yeah, using both and kind of alternating between the two until you kind of got things to a sort of pitch or like an intensity um, that, resemb that resembled what you were going for, I guess. Totally. And I have yeah. a... Go a ahead. quote from you in an interview. Sorry, Kaz, go ahead. <laughs> no, let's do the quote. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I think it, it ties in because you said you put yourself in situations and your reaction contributes to the characterization. You put different circumstances into motion that make you really uninhibited. And I think that that's something that Kaz is really amazing um, at doing is just kind of like setting up these circumstances where you can kind of disarm yourself and let that character live. Mm. totally yeah and you know in the past with with my my other films I loved working with non-actors or just sort of really kind of raw personas that mm -hmm. I would you know the script would be filtered through this sort of living entity and all my dialogue would be you know transformed or all my ideas I'd have to readapt or would be challenged um, by this process and you know how heavy this hammer all the dialogue now with the flemish accent uh rather than you know what i had imagined initially uh but obviously very different working with dara is the first time i've worked with an actor like dara. so i think it became I, I sort of had to sort of rethink how i approached films and it became sort of a a long collaboration uh, between us uh, or which i really needed to help you know, challenge my ideas and, you know, um, find trust in the character and, and, and trust in some of the moments that we were finding. Yeah, yeah it, in terms that of like a film, oh, sorry, go ahead. There's a bit of lag, there's a bit of lag. Uh, we keep, yeah, please, this is after you, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, it's my fault that the Wi-Fi in France isn't amazing, but the film feels like this kind of, I guess, like correspondence between like two artists, you as a director and Dara as an actor, and you're kind of corresponding to kind of like craft this individual. Um, and I feel like an important component, I guess, like in capturing this correspondence is uh, Nikolai Mihailov, who's an incredible cinematographer. And I feel like there was a lot of trust built between yourself, Dara and Nikolai, because you feel this like push and pull and he's, he's so close to you during the whole film. It's just, there's this very intense magnetic chemistry between yourself and the lens of the camera. And this ties into a question from the audience. Someone is really curious to know why the whole film was shot in close up. So I was wondering if the two of you could talk a little bit about um, the collaboration with Nikolai and that aesthetic decision to shoot the film in that way. I always love it when Dara talks about Nikolai and their sort of special relationship. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's part of it. You know, like a lot of a lot of cinematographers would have, you know, like all these assistants and have these really elaborate lighting setups. 
And I mean, on one level, there's something really uh, pragmatic and cost effective and resourceful of that. But I think also through that process of, of Nikolai being so singular, it just allows a certain mm -hmm. sensitivity for the camera. And I feel like, uh, you know, throughout the production that him, him and, and Dara had quite a special bond. I mean, with the camera being so close to her all the time and, uh, you know, a certain sensitivity. I don't know if you have anything to add Dara, if you want to talk about. Yeah, Nikolai is the best. And he actually is my, I mean, maybe besides Sophia is my most frequent collaborator. I think I've been on four projects with Nikolai. Um, but it's 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 more particular in, in Kaz's film because yes, he is so close. Um, but Nikolai, uh, yeah, I mean, you would you would think by the camera being that close that it would be intrusive, um, but in a weird way, sometimes when a camera is wide, you can feel its presence a bit more, and you can feel a little bit more watched. Um, but Nikola, what he has that's so amazing is, I think I've described it before, kind of as like a narrative awareness, like though what he can see is very focused. He's just seeing what the camera sees. He's very aware of everything that's happening around him um, and like very aware of like what the different characters are doing as, and kind of where a action has moved. So he can completely, if suddenly I've started talking to Oliver, he will just completely move and be, be capturing that. Um, and he doesn't even really, so yeah, that actually even, the camera almost becomes another actor in terms of how quickly he's responding um, to what's going on in front of him. Um, and yeah, and I think, I think there is like a kind of, in terms of communication between you and Nikolai Kaz, I feel like you guys have a, you guys kind of understand what you're most interested in seeing in a scene as well. And that he's pretty good at, um, because like he's worked on you, with you on so many films at this point as well, that like this thing you were talking about in the, the bar, in the Tinder scene of kind of look of, of that sort of discomfort and like those facial expressions of people kind of trying to readjust themselves and, and figure out how to respond. And those awkward facial motions between uh, being taken aback and regathering yourself. I think Nikolai kind of knows at this point that that's what you're interested in um, and kind of looks for it as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's true about everyone on on the crew too. I mean, we're a tight knit group, but everyone is a sort of major collaborator artistically. And they're all, we've all worked together for so long too, that there are these sort of instincts or sort of intangibles, or these sort of things that we can sort of instinctually get or sort of get without sometimes communicating so much that, yeah, Nikolai, you know, shot my previous feature and a number of shorts with me too, that it's, yeah, uh, you know, I can't say enough <laughs> about Nikolai, uh, but back, to um, the close up, you know, for reasons I just sort of said in a certain sort of intimacy and, you know, immediacy and keeping the crew, the crew small, but I would say more sort of conceptually why everything is in, in close up. I, I guess the first thing worth maybe saying is that all, all my films look like this or, um, you know, definitely my early shorts and other two features use this close up style and, you know, there's, there are a lot of reasons why why the films are shot this way, but I think what's emerged is really come to be, I think just this feeling of being very close to someone, but uncomfortable. And there's something you said earlier, Sophia, about it being fractured. Um, this is something that's really important. And, you know, Cassavetes is, um, a frequent comparison and, and, you know, rightly so, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'd be indebted to him without like, the use of close up. But if we were to talk about close up and this feeling of fractured, I think that's one thing I'm consciously very influenced by him. And that's what I love so much about his films is this sort of disorientation, how he would sort of open scenes and we wouldn't exactly understand the dynamic of what's going on between the characters. 
And on one level, that's something that's very alienating, something that's confusing, but inherently how I always feel with his films, and I, I hope there's a feeling that comes across in my films is there's an empathy there that it's, it's harder to pigeonhole someone uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to sort of allow this intimacy and this sort of vitality of being so close to someone, but at the same time, don't want to feel too comfortable watching them, want to always be sort of readjusting and, and, and reassessing um, them. And it's, it's that, that sort of feeling I think I'm chasing. And that's, I think, how I sort of arrived at this process of being, you know, close to something, something, you know, that we can something feels true and we're up close and there's a texture to it, but at the same time, it's sort of totally mm -hmm. mysterious too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And I, I think that um, creatively, I think what that yields to is like, I don't know, a fully fledged human being because I think all humans, um, you know, are imperfect and a little bit fractured as they gain life experience. So, um, it's a very um, real portrait in that sense. Um, and the audience is really curious um, on that note um, because we're talking a little bit about like discovering the moment and character. Um, they really wanted you to talk a little bit more about how you developed improvisation um, in tandem with like the script um, and how you went about discovering certain moments. Like, do you have like a certain example where you felt like you were working between the script and a moment and you're like, we discovered something really interesting here. Um, I think, again, what I always return to is sort of uh, time being like really important. So I'm trying to imagine like different, different scenes um, or, or try to remember how we approach them. But I would say like one in particular would be that the cup throwing scene. Mm. Uh, that, <laughs> that in the script, um, in the script, I mean, that was there and, and it's based on a true story and, and believe it or not. You, do you witness that? As a no, kid? it's an anecdote or a, you know, a, a tale from, from the daycare, uh, like a legend folklore of that daycare <laughs> conflict between two staff. Um, and it, yeah, it's a toned down version of what happened. Um, so th that was in the script and the seed was there. Um, but, you know, it was a lot of discussion, I think, how we approached that scene. In part, it was casting and, and finding the right um, actor to play the supervisor and finding that tension and having Dara <laughs> sort of volunteer at a daycare and get a feeling of that, you know, uh, people working alongside each other in a high stress job. And mm -hmm. I think that accumulated for a while to get to the point where we actually were felt, because it was a big scene that we wanted, we needed to find a way into it. And then I think we did a number of exercises with Suzanne too, and sort of mm -hmm. approached it in different ways until we finally got to that moment. And then when we did get to that, that scene, I think we attacked it in a lot of different angles. Like we shot a pretty high ratio and, I think that we, we had some sort of lower key approaches to it and then some some high, high you know, but like it was a great experience on my end. And I think there were some real breakthroughs when we actually filmed it. One of my favorite bits of dialogue is, is Dara be just saying, you are so, just the hesitation and then you are so dumb, but just that exasperation <laughs> is something I could never find on paper. And it was almost somehow, you know, that was like, a, aha, like, I love that. that like, scene. if you'd written that down, it would have been so hard to deliver. Yeah, but we somehow got it through yeah. there. So that's what comes, I mean, if that gives an it, example that it's it's on the page. And but yeah, there are scenes that just sort of completely happen um, spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Again, like there's stuff that's closer to actually almost being documentary like, like I said earlier, mm -hmm. the scene with the butterfly and the kids. Maybe later in the film, you know, uh, when when Dara's uh, skydiving, and then there's that scene of her vaping uh, with <laughs> with all the jumpers. I mean, we just yeah. <laughs> saw them vaping, and we'd be like, hey, let's let's join in on the group vape um, before the jump, like that. Could but be also, cool. that's arguably just like a different kind of writing, like yeah. like you'd seen we like these characters of these guys at the skydiving place and like that they they feel like snowboarders or skateboarders or something like they're kind of they have a particular um like they all dress in a similar kind of way they have this sort of like kind of uh extreme athlete 
vibe. Um, and then they all have these vapes. So I think it was you seeing that on like a previous time that we went to the skydiving place. Yeah. And, yeah. and then uh, that scene. And then it becomes sort of woven into the film. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Oliver is another example of that. Like I knew I wanted a, a precocious child but I didn't know I necessarily wanted a shark expert. But once, <laughs> once we were with Oliver, then we just sort of, that became ingrained into the film. And we knew, you know, we knew he would, how we, we had a sense of how he would react if we talked about sharks. Um, and and uh, it became part of the film and, and something we planned uh, around. Um, and then, yeah, I, I suppose another level of the improvisation is to, is also like some characters expanded a bit more in the film, in particular supporting mm -hmm. characters. Uh, so I think, you know, we haven't, we haven't spoken about one of the other major collaborators of the film yet, but yeah, Matt Johnson, who's uh, sort of the, mm. the main supporting actor in the film, um, also a mutual friend, also a filmmaker in his own right. Um, I, I definitely wanted to work with, with, I wrote it with the film with him in mind. I just wasn't sure until I both saw them on camera together, what it would be like. And I think Dara, you might've been a little hesitant too. We both were. <laughs> But yeah, it just worked so well that we en I ended up writing more scenes for Matt and he became a bigger a bigger part of the film. Um, what what I found so funny about Matt is like, I mean, I was I was ex excited to work with Matt. Um, and the days with him were actually some of my favorite because he does, he brings so much energy, um, kind of, I guess, a bit similar to the character and that you don't really have any choice but to kind of meet him there and I think like like having seen his films and seeing seeing Nirvana the band the show I guess I kind of expected that he would really be driving the scene and that the scene very much would be me being in the position that a lot of the other characters in Anne at 13,000 feet are in of kind of like like just trying to keep my balance or something but in a weird way, watching it, it's almost like Matt let me be him to him. Like, I feel like <laughs> like in that scene- The tables were turned. Yeah, exactly. That scene um, in my uh, mother's house, I feel like mm -hmm. I'm being Matt Johnson to Matt Johnson. Just like, but he, he really let me do that and gave me the space mm -hmm. to do that. And I really appreciated it because it did, that kind of jokester aspect of her, I feel like is something that we discovered as we went along as well. Mm -hmm. So her wanting to kind of be the joke master and craft these weird socially awkward jokes was something that came out of this dynamic with Matt a little bit, would you say? I wonder, do you think so, Cass? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm going to steer definitely about, uh, oh, a history of, of socially uh, uncomfortable characters in Kaz's film. So it's not completely out of nowhere. I feel like they're socially uncomfortable, but they're also very um, real and accessible, which is what makes the filmmaking so great. Um, and I wanted to steer it to the skydive because people are very curious about that. There's a moment when I was reviewing the film for this actually where I noticed that you're like passed out and you kind of like are woken up by the person who's holding you in the skydive that you're tethered to. Um, and that kind of ties into this person who would like to know about the challenges of shooting at 13,000 feet and you had any special equipment, what was that like? But I'm really curious about whether you actually passed out or not something I was wondering when I was watching the film. Well, I'll let Kaz speak to the equipment, but um, no, I did not actually pass out. That was mm -hmm. the second time I dove and Kaz, I think, had seen a video of that happening to a guy in midair. So ooh, we wanted to recreate that. And so I, I did that, like, I think two or three times on the way down. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah, the footage is amazing. It's, uh, I mean, if you see all three That's takes. That's incredible. It's like, 
Dara like is, is one day directing herself me. in midair um, and is sort of does the whole pass of it and then starts it over again in midair. Will you send me that one day? Sure. Yeah. You go get it on a hard drive. Yeah. I'd um, love to see that as well. <laughs> but yeah, to talk about equipment, I mean, what's amazing um, about skydivers or what worked out so well is that, I mean, I kind of feel like all skydivers are also filmmakers or that you know using gopros and recording their jumps is how they share mm -hmm. them um so so mm -hmm. much of skydiving is sort of learning how to film each other in midair um that their dives are almost like camera moves um but it took us it took me a little while to realize that um i think i definitely overthought it at first or Nikolai and I were really trying to get our camera in midair or a camera like ours. And there's all these complications. Uh, like if you, the, the most typical way to do it is to mount it on the skydiver's helmet. But if the camera is too heavy, there's like right. a danger of whiplash. Um, so we had a very convoluted setup for Dara's first jump. And um, it's the first day of shooting. Um, the first thing we shot, her first time jumping out of the plane. And, um, some of that footage made it into the film, but a lot of it we didn't like. Uh, when Nikolai and I looked at the footage, uh, <laughs> we were afraid to tell Dara. <laughs> and um, so what we ended up doing um, is we did a camera test and we did a camera test where I jumped out of the plane. I've never gone skydiving before. And we did a camera test on me with a few other options. And the option we ended up using or the footage that we see in the film is actually just like a 4K GoPro. Um, mm -hmm. mounted on the skydiver's arm, which just gave us like the right angle. And we found that if we crop that, it, it works. But anyways, we showed Dara that footage and um, Dara very kindly jumped again. And, um, and that's also when we recorded that, uh, the midair fainting as well. Um, that's impressive. I, I never knew that um, she was instructed to do that midair because I know how much of a terrifying <laughs> thing it was for you to do um, but also I guess um, following through on a cue is um, additionally impressive I'm really glad I asked that question mm. <laughs> um, so um, we have another question from the audience um, and there's a person who's very curious about um, Anne's mental health state and wants to know uh, the particularities of her condition. I know that you left um, this to be ambiguous um, on purpose um, and you wanted to leave it open to the audience um, and I was wondering if the two of you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah again I would say like almost all my films are about mental health in some capacity mm -hmm. um, but yeah I've seen particular tower and hammer definitely deal with different social anxieties or depression. Um, and it's interesting making the, those films and people's reaction. And, you know, I remember with Tower, somebody watching it and saying, this is the film about Asperger's. This is the best film I've seen about Asperger's. I have Asperger's and this is a film about Asperger's and that sort of caught me by surprise, but was very welcome. But yeah, Dar Darren and I definitely, you know, talked about you know, the history of this character and the character's backstory. And this is sort of a new process for me. And I think maybe we talked about it too much, or maybe I did, that we read a lot of memoirs. We did a lot of research. This film was made through uh, various arts councils. And part of our application mm -hmm. is that we knew the sort of waters we wanted to, to, to sort of go into, and we wanted to make sure we were doing it the right way. So it was important for us to have consultants that were sort of mad affiliated um, so we spoke with a lot of doctors and in the test screenings too, we, we screened the film for a lot of uh, people that work in mental health. And it was interesting um, because their feedback really sort of reaffirmed how I felt about it, that the film, they said that the film was more useful uh, or it's more true to life if we, if we don't have a diagnosis. And there were elements that we stripped out of the film, you know, medication or um, more overt scenes with a therapist that it just the film there's something just that felt so limiting about the film being prescriptive and that yes mm -hmm. it is you know a film in many ways about mental health but we don't we didn't want to diagnose the character and I, I suppose when I think about mental health in my life or people with their 
their own histories. It's private, even people that I live with very intimately. I don't know what medication exactly they take. I don't know. I, I don't listen in on their conversations with their therapists. So it, it somehow just felt right, you know, that mm -hmm. to sort of keep it in this realm. And I think, you know, the film that we ended up making is sort of true, I think, to what our interest was. And that if we, you know, I, I understand a desire to, to want to know exactly what it is. And again, I love sort of hearing feedback of people who have, you know, their own lives and personal experiences that relate to the film very specifically, even though that's mm -hmm. not what we necessarily- intend. They see themselves in it. Yeah, no, I've, I see like tweets saying like, this is the most, you know, uh, accurate, you know, portrayal of this type of bipolarism. And it's like, that's yeah. great that that fit, but that, you know, it, I think it could be anxiety. I think it could be a lot of mm -hmm. things. Um, yeah, I feel like to an extent, like if she was offered a straightforward diagnosis, it kind of like explains away her behavior and maybe doesn't um, like allows you to maybe stop paying as much attention to the particularities of her behavior and stops. I don't know. I think maybe would stunt your your curiosity a little bit. Whereas for it to be unexplained, you you keep paying attention to her and keep empathizing and keep wondering what it is she needs or what it is she's going through. Um, and then that's a kind of important um, attention to have throughout the film. And I think also too, when I think back to initial inspirations or conflicts or things, I mean, the relationship with the mother is so important and, mm. you know, they almost wanting to present a, a history or a precaution or that this is like has been an ongoing dialogue you know and it's it's not you know navigating her diagnosis it's sort of living with an experience and mm -hmm. you know i think the mother is one of the characters i relate to the most as much as i relate to Anne too but it's that sort of tension and that sort of fear of stigmatization or how, how you sort of exist within society, how you feel about yourself, how others feel about you, how people, you know, it's, it's even people who, who love you and care about you and have nothing but good intentions. And it's sort of the weight of all of that. And again, I think it might have not landed as well if we tried to pin it to something very, you know, medical or very, you know, very specific that, that that sort of the I think by keeping by by hiding that or, or not having that there it allowed for for I think that to come more to the foreground or at least that's that's my hope yeah and I feel like there's this clever juxtaposition of moment where she's drowning and thriving and hysterical and trying to calm down um was done really well um in the the edit and Dario you're talking about you know um really just like wanting to, to pay attention to this character and what's going on. And I feel like this thing with like not knowing, but also in combination with the way that you built and um, kept us wanting to kind of look at her for um, a really long time. And we, we really want to be as close to her as we are because of the film is, because of the way the film is crafted. Um, and I just want to ask this one last question and then I'm going to hand it over to Charlie who, um, had a couple of questions and wanted to close, but we didn't talk about Isla Adobasic, um, your amazing editor that you've been collaborating with for a long time. And um, in speaking about fractured portraits um, and personalities, I feel like that came together really well in the editing because there are these moments where a character is talking and then they stop talking and you hear their next line from the next shot. Um, and they're not speaking, but then you cut to that next shot all of a sudden. And there's this kind of like disjointed energy there, but it's kind of, it, it gives the feeling of this like conversation that you're having that's that's difficult. And it's so difficult that you can't like fully be present there all the time. And I, I felt like there were moments like this that were done so effectively. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, working with her and also Dara was curious to know what your reaction was to the film the first time you saw it. Yeah, I mean, Isla is, yeah, so important to the whole process um, or even just to my, you know, my practice. Like she's cut everything I've made. We went to film school mm -hmm. together. We sort of, 
we learned how to make films together. And uh, yeah, like I, you know, when I was talking about Nikolai, there's just so much trust in our process. And again, like it, we've talked a bit earlier about improvisation. Um, and I guess people often think of that as being on set, but I, I suppose if I was to compare my editing process to other filmmakers, we're const I'm like a, constantly rethinking the film and the edit, moving scenes around. The, the opening was found in, in the editing room, that whole idea of juxtapositions and experimenting with it. And uh, when I work with Isla, I think, I mean, her instincts are just so important um, on, you know, major sort of conceptual decisions like that, but also just in terms of the rhythm of a performance. And mm -hmm. just, again, like I was saying, sort of intangible sort of decisions of, of sort of pacing and rhythm um, that she's got just such an incredible uh, feel for that. But I, I, and then I suppose the other thing I could say about the editing too, is that, um, or even just back to this idea of improvisation that or even just with the script, you know, there's just, the script's never finished. There's just a new draft. And I feel like when we're in the editing room, those are those are new drafts and we're mm -hmm. cutting the film as we shoot it. So what works in the editing suite is informing what's happening on set or the decisions mm -hmm. that are being made on set. So um, yeah, it's, uh, again, it's, it's like coming at it from a lot of different angles, but um, yeah, everything, you know, is challenged and rethought um, you know, a thousand times in the editing room um, that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I liked that creative space a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think when I first saw it, I mean, not to toot our own horns or anything. <laughs> um, no, when I, when I first saw it, I was, I was really moved. Um, I think because the scenes required me being present um i didn't really know how i appeared or what i was revealing um and so when i saw the film i don't know it it just really felt maybe this is a weird way to put it but it really felt like it was for Anne. like it really felt like um yeah as you said empathetic and also just like yeah, that they, that Kaz and Isla saw her, um, mm. which, yeah, which I, I mean, it was, it was a pleasure to meet her, <laughs> be like, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's so stupid, because of course, someone was watching, they were filming it, but it was like, um, oh, yeah, that person has been seen, or something, you know, <laughs> no, I think it's a really beautiful thing because I think, you know, for the whole film, we're with her, we're not above her, we're 13,000 feet above her. Please don't hate me, I had to, I had to. Um, but thank you so much um, for chatting with me. I'm going to hand it over to Principal Charlie, um, who just has a couple of questions for you, and he's going to give his closing remarks. I miss you. Thank miss you guys you. too <laughs> anytime <laughs> it's uh it's one of the pleasures i have of hosting these that i get to horn in and ask a few questions um Sophia doesn't have to leave oh she probably wants to go to sleep <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i can stay if you want me to but i, I don't oh, really please do please do me. but i i'm going to try to keep this brief because i don't want to test either the endurance of our guests or the patience of our attendees who may not want to hear my questions. But actually, your last question, Sophia, anticipated the one I had. And I'm going to try to tie it into my second question. So this can just be kind of omnibus. And that's that um, the editing seems key to the way in which the character is constructed, as you've said. Is all, it also works very much in concert with this close-up style. But my question was um, that that kind of fracturing also sort of dis erupts any notion of continuity that comes from another kind of style that is often yoked to realism, which is this long take style where you just stay with characters, there's very little intervention, and that's also often aligned with a documentary aesthetic. And so you're clearly making a really strong decision to go all in on the fractured approach. And I wondered how you see that in relationship to a notion of realism that's often tied to its antithesis, which is this long take. 
And, and just give you one example, like when you talked about the cup scene, I was noticing that, and I'm assuming this is deliberate, like the cup is in different states of, of kind of like wholeness <laughs> as you move through. And so it isn't, you know, it's clearly you're getting shots from later in the cup incident interspersed with cups from earlier. Similarly, when Anne's in the bathroom having uh, gotten drunk and her shoes are on and then they're off. And so I just wondered if you could say something about the notion of continuity versus a kind of realism that's assumed to be mostly attached to long take. Sorry, that question went on too long. Yeah, Speaking no, I mean, I, I, I think the first time I ever found my, my, my footing as a filmmaker was making short documentaries, but I always felt a bit uncomfortable um, somehow with documentary that I love the, again, the realism and this feeling of so capturing something beyond words. But I almost, I, there was almost this feeling of wanting to be overt, of, of wanting to sort of show the hand of the director. And that's even partially, I think there with the use of the close up, but almost, that you know, e even the handheld camera work that we're keeping up with the character, that we're reacting, uh, that we're overwhelmed by the character too, and the gaps maybe also being gaps from the filmmaker um, that it is an incomplete portrait. Um, I am, you know, haunted by the ending too. That I, it, it's not a, a concise statement at all. It's I'm still, you know, I, I love doing these conversations because I'm still, you know thinking about the character and re rethinking it. Um, so yeah, this feeling of sort of working through these scenes, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that totally captures what you observe, but that's definitely a feeling I'd like of, of, of there being, you know, that even the opening scene, those juxtapositions are not to serve realism, though those are, those are creative decisions. Um, and it's, you know, almost like an intentional disorient Disor intentionally disorienting the audience with that, but in the service of it being, um, what's the right word? I, I can't quite find the right word, but there's almost a mus musicality of it or, or it being sort of abstract in this sort of emotion, you know, the, the edits are um, being done sort of emotionally or philosophically rather than the service of of realism I think and and it's that I think we talked about the opening a lot to strongly put it in that direction and I think I think I when it comes down to it I that is my interest as a filmmaker so it's almost firmly displaying that in the opening is, is something that's important to me that there was a fear of opening the film too much within realism and again, this desire from the audience to understand why we're watching this realistic depiction and how, how we are observing this character and waiting for there to be this sort of realist thrust of, of, of explaining the dynamic and a statement. But for me, the, as a filmmaker, it's just important to totally ground it in the sort of emotional sort of whirlwind. Um, which I think is even in you know those sort of specific examples, I, I think it's sort of doing that on a, on a smaller level of you know how we're navigating that that argument between between um, Anne and Suzanne, for instance. Yeah. 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 Emo like large emotional brush strokes or something. And my second question, because I couldn't possibly integrate a question into a question as long as my first one. Uh, is how you all feel. You all know one another well. You've collaborated in different ways. Matt Johnson, filmmaker, also in the film, as you mentioned. Just wondering about how you react to this notion that there's this new, well, not maybe not new, but there's this group of recently minted film school graduates or people connected to that scene who are now defining the way in which, especially Toronto-based filmmaking, but one could make a case of Canadian filmmaking, that it's really coalescing around this kind of network of artists. Do you feel that as you're in it? Do you feel like you're kind of defining Canadian film in a way that maybe hasn't happened for a while? Heavy mantle to put on you, I realized. Um, well, I always, I liked this thing that Andrea Picard said um, in like, I think it was like, 
the first interview we did about Anne at TIFF for like the platform, uh, I don't, yeah, for the platform interviews, um, which is just mentioning that like all these people that you're mentioning that are making movies are also people that watch movies and that like we're all like most of us are film students and um, are always going to the Cinematheque when that was something that you were able to do. And that it it is a group of people that are, uh, I guess, yeah, audience members as well as filmmakers and that they're part, we're part of a dialogue together. And I think in terms of like defining a moment in Canadian cinema, I think what's just exciting about it is that like, is that people are really making things. And I, I think what I always have been impressed with, with Sophia and Kaz is like, like they, they are creating the, their own conditions for their work, you know, like they have, um, they have built an infrastructure for themselves in which they are able to have this real directness from like what their curiosity is and what they're thinking about to what they make. And so they are able to make uh, things like fairly prolifically um, that have like a really strong connection to their lives as film lovers in Canada, you know? So it is, I mean, it's an exciting thing, I think. Yeah. I mean, I would say as a Canadian filmmaker or the identity identities of Canadian filmmakers is, is always like very complicated. And there's always this feeling of, of of needing to approximate how films are made somewhere else or there being this moment where, OK, you've made your small films and then now you make now you do things in a more traditional way. And what I guess what I've seen is um, more and more filmmakers sort of stay staying true to, to, to themselves and, and, and um, you know, I, I know it's definitely true about how Dan, um, who's produced all my films, um, and I feel that we didn't want to suddenly, you know, change or make a huge leap, that we wanted to just keep building, you know, what we had found and that we've, we, we really just love this, this sort of specificity of where we've come from. And I would say on a broader scale, yeah, I mean, I see that um, happening across Canada, uh, you know, in Vancouver with The Body Remembers or in Nova Scotia with Werewolf. Um, and what's exciting is that these films are having a major impact and, you know, are, are getting nominated for CSA prizes, you know, something that seemed totally not, not for us, you know, if I was to look back to when we made Tower or, or earlier projects. So it is sort of startling now seeing, you know, and win a TFCA prize or, or, or things like that, that, that we, that we, yeah, we didn't have to, you know, rethink everything that, you know, our, or, or start working with a more senior producer that, you know, that we've been able to just steadily keep, keep our focus and uh, together and I think that's felt you know across the board and you know and I'm inspired by other filmmakers you know I'm inspired by Sophia and the films that she makes and you know I think we all collectively feel more reinforced when we see uh, you know our peers make make strong work totally. yeah well, and I think that's what's nice about being able to do this Q&A tonight um, I think that COVID has been a difficult thing just in terms of being um displaced and I think in having this dialogue with Kaz and Dara I'm kind of reminded of how strong I think the community is um, in Toronto and how you know as Kaz is saying you know we're all very I think authentic and true to I guess our own visions and we only encourage ourselves to do so so hopefully um, the situation will be over soon and we can kind of get things back to a normal-ish pace. We'll see. Well, thank you. And congratulations to you all on your various endeavors. And we're happy to facilitate <laughs> the little ways that we can uh, getting your work out there and discuss uh, and seen. 
So, um, Sophia, thanks so much for staying up as late as you did to moderate. My pleasure. Thank you, Kaz and Dara, for your thoughtful answers. And your wonderful film. <laughs> So uh, I just will, as I often do, or when we're closing, I'll just alert you to our next event. Uh, on May 27th, we have a special event uh, tied around the film Picture a Scientist, and we will have three scientists, there's a surprise, <laughs> um, featured as our guests. Uh, we will have Median Andrade and Molly Shoykat, and the moderator will be Megan Fredrickson. Those are the three scientists. And then we'll have filmmaker Ian Cheney uh, along as well. And on sometime in June, late, after we have a spate of uh, alumni and student-based events, which are going to keep us away from you viewers for a while, we'll be back with a late June um, book event tied to Michelle Orange's Pure Flame. So stay tuned for more details on that. We'll have the exact date soon enough. So once again, thanks to our three guests, Sophia, Kaz, and Dara, and good night to everyone. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye. Thank you.